Now we have completed the first two lessons uh, for this unit under my part. The first lesson was the fluid flow behavior. And the second one, we discussed the heat transfer. The, we discussed three different modes of heat transfer. And also we looked at uh, the, some possible involvement of heat transfer during uh, the material processing as well. The third lesson uh, for this unit under my part would be polymer processing. Okay, so as I mentioned before, so this uh, the unit is, is uh, materials processing. It covers the processing of polymers, ceramics, and metals, actually. In my part, I'm focusing on the polymer processing, and the pink uh, will look at uh, the metals and ceramics. Okay, so today, let's start the, the lesson number three, the polymer processing. So I'm going to look at uh, the number of different uh, polymer processing techniques. Some of the processes are in detail, and also some of them are in very briefly, right? For some processes, we can look at uh, the, the processing mechanisms and the related equations to model the flow behavior, and uh, the so on, uh, we can look at uh, the quite number of different polymer processes uh, uh, in, this, in this lesson actually. There's a list of possible reading materials and all of them are again available in the library in the hard formats and also in the soft format as well. When we discuss about polymer processing, we have to discuss about the, the flow diagram for the polymer melt processing. As I mentioned you before at a few different times, so mostly we process most of the materials at the molten state. And for the polymers also, it is the same story. And then uh, we would like to process polymer materials at the molten state. Uh, so we can just uh, the, uh, the force them into a dye uh, easily and then get into the desired shape if they are in molten state. So therefore, most of the polymeric materials are processed at uh, the liquid state or molten state. So then let's see what is the related uh, the, uh, the flow diagram for polymer melt processing. In most of the polymer processing applications, we start the process with uh, the feed in the solid polymer. That material could be in different form. It could be pellets, the flakes or granules, uh, or it could be in powder form as well, but it still it is in solid state. And only quite a few processes sometimes use the, the molten material uh, as the, the initial uh, the processing material, but the majority of processes use the solid polymer uh, as the initial or the, the feed in material uh, for, for their processes. Then the solid poly material will undergo a few different stages uh, during the processing. So uh, the one could be solids conveying, the solid material will convey along the processing machine while absorbing heat. And also there could be some uh, heat generation within the machine as well, uh, like uh, the friction and viscous heat generation. After that material will enter to the melting zone or otherwise we call it uh, the plastication. Within the melting zone, material should absorb the heat further and then it should become fully molten before moving it into the mixing uh, the zone. Okay, the normally the mixing zone and pumping zone are quite the same. They, they just comes together in most of the applications. So we have to mix the material to, to make a homogeneous polymer melt. And then we can pump that homogeneous melt uh, into, the, uh, into the dye. The homogeneous mean the, the melt should be homogeneous in composition and also it should be homogeneous in temperature as well. Okay, so then, then we can uh, the force the material or the molten material uh, into, the, into the dye. Okay, so these are the pre-shaping steps, solids can in plastication or melting, uh, mixing and pumping. Here the plastication is an important uh, the, uh, part. So as we have to provide the heat to melt the material. Okay, the amount of heat needed for a material depends on the nature of the material and also the geometry of the machine and the screw as well. Okay, so here we have to provide the heat into the machine. Okay, so then we can use uh, the normal conductive heat transfer in most of the applications. And also apart from this, uh, the heat uh, provided externally, there could be some heat generation inside the machine itself uh, due to the, the, the friction between materials and also due to the, uh, the viscous dissipation as well. Right, so as I mentioned before now, so we can provide the heat into the machine externally using uh, some heater systems. Or it could be cartilage heaters wrapped around the extruder barrel, or it could be some resistive heaters that we use uh, depending on the, the geometry of the machine. And there could be steam circulations or hot fluid circulation, sometimes even within the screws of the processing machines, okay, or otherwise it could be oil or water, uh, the circulation as well. And there as I mentioned in the previous lesson, we also can use infrared uh, radiation to heat up the work pieces before they permit into the desired shape. For example, uh, the, we can just uh, the, uh, the, uh, use infrared radiation to heat up uh, the, uh, the, the capsule that we use to produce uh, the, some of the plastic bottles. Uh, apart from this heat provided externally, 
So there could be some heat generation inside the machine as well. So we call it mechanical working of the polymer, right? So one of the possible ways could be the, the frictional heat generation. So as we, as we just feed the material uh, in the solid state, so then these material can rub against each other or they can just uh, the, the post against or rub against or move against uh, the, the solid surfaces of the, uh, the processing chamber. For example, sometimes in polymer processing extruders, the material can just uh, the, the, uh, the have a relative motion between the screw, uh, screw surface and also barrel surface. Due to that relative motion, there could be frictional heat. And, and also as material absorbs heat, so they will turn into like a viscous be behavior or we call this spongy-like behavior. So then uh, the, they can expand, contract, or they, they then due to that motion, so there could be some heat generation. So we call it viscous heat dissipation uh, as well. Okay, so therefore we can provide the, the heat uh, to the machine externally, and also there could be internal heat generation due to the viscous heat dissipation and also due to the frictional heat. Okay, so this viscous heat dissipation and the frictional heat uh, can depend on the material type, and also it depends on the surfaces of the processing machine and uh, the geometry of the processing machine as well. Right in the free shaping step, uh, the heat transfer is the, the most uh, the important uh, the aspects that we have to look into. And then after that, so we have to look at the real of the polymer. So because now the polymer is under molten state after uh, the melting, okay? So then we have to discuss the Newtonian, non-Newtonian behavior, okay? So these are important, right? Then we have the polymer melt flow. So, okay, so then it will go into the shaping stage now, okay? So we started with the solid polymer and then that polymer will undergo into different stages within the processing machine or processing chamber. And then we'll have uh, the, the molten material so that mode material can be uh, the post into the desired shape. We call it the shaping stage. Okay, so there are a number of ways that we can shape a material depending on the, the type of the process. Okay, so you here you can see lots of uh, the information provided. Okay, it could be forming into a, like uh, the, some particular tubular shape. We can extrude it or we can form it into a, the thin film. Okay, so it could be a kind of uh, the, the uh, uh, hollow product. Okay, so there are a number of different ways that we can shape the material into the desired shape. So based on the nature of the product, uh, sometimes based on the nature of the material, we have to decide the most suitable shaping technique or the processing technique for a given material. Okay, it could be flow through dyes, extrusion process. Okay, the uh, filling of mold cavities like injection molding, right? Uh, the flow between uh, the counter rotating rolls. So then we can just uh, the, uh, roll the material in. Whether it could be some process like blow molding, thermoforming, the blown film to produce some thin films for packaging applications. And likewise, uh, the rotational molding. So that is mostly used to produce some hollow component. Okay, so there are a number of different stages or the processes that we can use uh, to process the material uh, in, the, in the shaping stage as well. After forming the material into the desired shape, so now we have to decide how we can establish its shape. Right, so here the material is still in the molten state. So then after that, we have to the cure the material or cure the product uh, to get the desired shape, okay, without having distortion. So therefore we have to decide how we're going to cool it down or how we're going to cure it. Sometimes we can cool the material or the product very rapidly or sometimes very slowly. So based on the rate of cooling, uh, the crystallization behavior of the material could be different as well, okay. Uh, the, in here, I want to highlight is that during the shape stabilization also sometimes we have to provide the heat or we could have to uh, the, remove the heat from the process, okay? It's again depends on the nature of the material. I hope you know two different type of uh, the polymers we call thermosetin polymers and thermoplastic polymers. Here, the thermosetin polymers are important actually. It's a special type of polymer, right? So once we heat them up, so they will undergo a special type of reaction. So that reaction is irreversible, okay? During that reaction, what will happen? So there will be a network formation within the material, okay? So uh, that reaction is irreversible. So due to that, the thermosetin polymers cannot be reprocessed. That means once we form uh, a thermosetin polymer into a desired shape, we cannot uh, the reprocess uh, and uh, the uh, reproduce uh, different material, okay? The, the reason is that the reaction takes place during the heating of uh, the thermosetin polymers it's, it's a irreversible reaction and then there will be a network formation. So therefore we cannot reprocess that material and reform into a different shape, right? So for the thermosetting polymers uh, to the shape stabilization or for curing process, we have to provide the heat. 
okay the curing of thermosetting polymers takes place while uh, the adding the heat okay. therefore for thermosetting polymers we have to maintain some certain amount of heat uh, with the shaping unit uh, until it is being fully cured okay otherwise there will be some problems right again in the shape stabilization process also the heat transfer is important uh, for the thermosetting polymers as we have to maintain some certain heat or we have to add some heat during the shape stabilization stage of the thermosetting polymers okay but for the thermoplastic polymers it is the opposite behavior actually right the thermoplastic polymers are not like thermosetting polymers so uh, they can be reprocessed and reform into a different shapes a few different times uh, without much uh, deterioration of uh, their properties okay however for the thermoplastic polymers uh, for their shape stabilization or curing uh, we have to cool down the the shaping unit okay that means we have to take the heat out from the uh, the shaping units uh, or the die uh, during the shape stabilization okay shape stabilization of the thermoplastic polymers depends on the crystallization behavior of the the thermosetting polymers actually okay as i mentioned you before so we can cool these materials uh, the slowly or rapidly based on that their crystallization behavior will be different right so therefore the properties will also be different or otherwise we can just uh, the do something called vitrification so that means we just cool it rapidly and then uh, the that we can have a different crystallization behavior actually right so Therefore, for the thermosetting polymers, we have to maintain some certain heat with the dye or the the shaping unit uh, during the curing of those products. And for any product made out of thermoplastic polymers, we have to cool them down to control the crystallization behavior uh, during the shape stabilization process. Okay, so in, during this stage also, the heat transfer is important. So some some materials we have to remove the heat. For some materials, we have to provide the heat during the shape stabilization. Okay, so by looking into this uh, the diagram, actually, you could see that the heat transfer is important during the pre-shaping stage and also in the shape stabilization stage. However, if you consider this flow diagram now, so there will be a question. So which one is the most dominant or time-consuming stage, actually? Okay, right. Here, for most of the processes, we could say that uh, the most time-consuming or the, uh, the dominant uh, the stages would be uh, the melting process or the plastication process, or otherwise it could be shape stabilization process. Okay, the some process like injection molding, more than half of the cycle time is just covered by the shape stabilization. So that means we have to cool the product down into a desired uh, the the time. Uh, otherwise, we cannot get the desired properties. Okay, so therefore uh, this stage could decide how long it will take to produce some certain product. Okay, if it is a mass production like injection molding, so this will decide how many products that you can manufacture per hour or per day. Okay, so it's really important that we control it properly uh, to get the desired properties as well. And also it is really important to control this process properly based on the nature of the material to get the desired properties of the product as well. Otherwise, so there will be some material degradation or there will be some loss of properties. So there could be several problems if you cannot maintain the heat transfer behavior in the proper way during the shape stabilization. This is the flow diagram for polymer melt processing. If you look at the overall uh, the, the uh, process or the stages of this uh, the flow diagram, you could see here we have to provide heat. And then here the, the rheology is important because there will be a, the fluid flow or the molten material will just flow within the, 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 the processing units or the dye. And then after that, again, we have to remove the heat to add heat uh, to the, the shaping unit. Uh, during the shape stabilization. So therefore, we could just claim that uh, the polymer processing is dominated by a combination of fluid flow and heat transfer behavior. So that is why we just learn the fluid flow behavior and heat transfer within this unit because these are really important um, uh, during the material processing. So therefore, it will be really important for you to know uh, those uh, the fluid flow behaviors and heat transfer behaviors as uh, the materials engineers. Okay, hope it is clear. I mentioned you before that thermosetting polymers uh, the cures irreversibly, right? So therefore, we can't just uh, the remelt and then reshape them into a different shape once we just uh, deform them into a, some particular shape. Okay, that uh, the reaction or the curing reaction is irreversible. Right? Therefore, the thermosetting polymers are not good in uh, the shaping into different the products uh, for a few different times. And also uh, here we can see that the curing process of thermosetting polymers may be induced by heat 
through a chemical reaction or an appropriate irradiation. Right, so I mentioned it before again for the thermosetting polymers. So we have to just uh, maintain the, the heat or we have to add heat during the, uh, the curing or the shape stabilization. Okay, that is the nature of the thermosetting polymer, right? Here you can see some particular examples for the thermosetting polymers, epoxy, uh, pionolic, vulcanized rubber, polyurethanes, bakelite, and polyesters. Okay, so these are the, some sort of examples uh, for thermosetting polymers. Although we cannot reprocess them quite a few times, it doesn't mean this is not an important material. Okay, so the thermosetting polymers are type of important materials like polyurethane, uh, bakelite. They are heavily used in a number of different applications because they have some specific properties so which we cannot obtain from the thermoplastic polymers. If you look at the thermoplastic polymers, they become fallible or moldable above a specific temperature, okay? And uh, they solidifies upon cooling of the melt, right? So that is a good property that we can uh, achieve with the thermoplastic polymers. So we can reprocess them and reshape them. So therefore we can recycle these products and then we can have a different product uh, quite a few times uh, without uh, losing their uh, properties uh, in, in a great quantity. Okay, some of the examples for the thermoplastic polymers could be nylon, okay, polycarbonate, uh, the polyethamide, polyethylene is a heavily used material, LLDP, LDP, and then high density polyethylene. Polypropylene is also again quite a popular material. Polystyrene is really popular as well, the PVC. So there are so many examples for the thermoplastic materials as well. Okay, apart from, apart from these two types, thermosetting polymers and thermoplastic polymers, we can just classify polymers into different other groups as well. Uh, the two types could be amorphous polymers and crystalline polymers. Okay, what is the main difference between the amorphous polymers and crystalline polymers? Amorphous polymers does not undergo a clear phase change process as we add the heat or we cool them down. Okay, so what will happen is that uh, the amorphous polymers just turn into rubbery state from their glassy state as we add heat that specific transition point from glassy to rubbery or rubbery to glassy is known as the glass transition, okay? The temperature related to that transition point is known as the, the glass transition temperature or we call it Tg, okay? So the properties of amorphous polymers could heavily depend on which side they are in, in terms of the glass transition, okay? Below and above the glass transition temperature, those materials behave uh, the differently in a quite, quite significant manner. Okay, for the crystalline polymers actually, so they will undergo a clear phase change process. Okay, that means if they are in the solid state, so they will turn into, uh, into a liquid by showing a clear phase change process. That phase change, we have to provide some certain amount of heat. Okay, so that the temperature which the phase change will take place is known as the melting temperature, right? So this, uh, this glass transition or the phase change will take place as we add in the heat to the material, okay? If we add the heat, so the amorphous polymers will just turn from glass to rubbery, but if you try to uh, the cool down amorphous polymer, it, so then it will just again come back to the glassy state, the passing through this glass transition. And this, in the same way, uh, there could be a, uh, the molten uh, the material of crystalline polymers, so then that material we can cool down, and during the cool down, again, there'll be a clear phase change so it is turning from molten state to solid state. During that time, there will be a certain amount of heat release uh, related to this phase change, okay? The phase change from solid state to liquid state is known as the latent heat of fusion. So we have to provide some certain amount of heat uh, during that phase change process. As it is quite well known, most of the polymers are poor thermal conductors, okay? So they have a very low thermal conductivity and also thermal diffusivity as well. So we know now uh, the, what is the meaning of thermal conductivity and thermal diffusivity as we discussed them before, right? If you compare with some of the metals, uh, the polymers are really poor in thermal conductivity. So therefore they will not allow uh, uh, to, to travel the heat quite easily. Here you can see that uh, the this thermal diffusivity of some particular metals is 10 to the minus six and uh, to 10 to the minus four, M squared is minus one. Okay, but for most of the polymers, it is in the range of 10 to the minus seven. Okay, so hope you remember that the thermal diffusivity is an indication of how quickly heat can travel through a material. Okay, so that means it is an important parameter as we try to cool down no, uh, the, the heat up a certain material. Okay, so due to this, uh, the very low thermal conductivity value of polymers, so they are quite difficult to heat and cool, right? So this is a real issue as we try to process them, right? So at the initial stage of processing of polymeric materials, we have to add the heat to convert them into the molten state. 
more, most probably from the solid state. And then at the last stage of processing, we have to just uh, the cool them down or heat them again uh, during the shape stabilization as well. So that, therefore we might have to face some challenges during the heating and cooling of polymers due to their poor thermal conductivity behavior. Okay, well, so if you just look at the previous, uh, the, uh, the flow diagram for polymer weight processing, so we can see that at two stages, we have to provide the heat uh, or to the process, okay? Initially at the, the, the uh, pre-shaping stage and at the end in the shape stabilization stage, okay? In the pre-shaping state, uh, the, the dominant one is the plastication and the shape stabilization stage. So we have to add uh, or remove heat from the process. So therefore, uh, the, the processing time or the production time for most of the processes uh, based on the polymeric materials are dominated by the plastication or the shape stabilization stage. So that means, so for some certain processes, half of the cycle will be the shape stabilization, right? Otherwise, uh, the dominant time from the complete cycle time could be plastication for the some other processes. However, for most of the processes, the shape stabilization stage would be the most dominant uh, the factor which decide the complete cycle time for a given product. That means sometimes more than the half of the cycle time for a given product could be covered by the shape stabilization time. So therefore, it would be really important for us to control this time because it will decide the, the time required for a, a manufacturing process. Okay, for example, let's say for a process like injection molding, if you can manufacture 10,000 uh, the parts per day, so if you don't select this shape stabilization process uh, quite properly, so let's say you, you're just uh, the, having uh, two seconds more than required, so uh, that means you are just losing uh, your production rate quite significantly per day. Okay, that two seconds per product uh, could, could be maybe thousands of products per day. Okay, so you have to control those stages or time them properly uh, to maintain uh, the efficiency of uh, your design or efficiency of your production lines actually. Okay, that is really important factor to decide the required time for each and every stage without having less or more. So then only you can have more efficient production uh, line without wasting energy, material, labor and etc. Okay, hope it is clear. I mentioned you before that we, we provide the heat to a process uh, using external heaters and also it could be some uh, the mechanical work of the, uh, the polymers as well. So that means there could be some heat generation within the processing unit as well. So that through friction and viscous heat dissipation. So if you rely completely on the conductive heat to heat up a polymeric material, so the plastication or the melting process can take ages. It could be really slow, okay? So the possible slow rate of conductive heating the other, other modes of heat generation are also important, okay? Like uh, the frictional heat or viscous heat dissipation. So they can play an important role uh, within the plastication process of polymers in a number of different processes, okay? Therefore, in some processes, uh, it is quite common to use the some conditions to promote uh, the other modes of heat generation like frictional heat and viscous heat. For example, in extruders, uh, the, there could be some special coating used uh, inside the barrel or on the screw surface to promote the conveying of the material. So that means to promote the, the friction of the material, okay? So depending on the coating used on the barrel wall and the screw surface, the frictional heat generation or the contribution from the frictional heat generation could be different, okay? So therefore, uh, it could really uh, the influence the time taken for the plastication process. Actually, we can provide some equations to calculate the amount of heat generated through these mechanisms, right? And if you look at the, the conductive heat or we call resistive heat, it's quite common equation that we use for the conductive heat. Uh, the, we know that it is I squared R. The amount of conductive heat can be calculated from the equation I squared R, okay? So this is a kind of common equation uh, uh, used in electrical engineering to calculate the uh, the thermal energy loss for each and every component, okay? So here I'll be in the current and the R is the resistor, okay? So this is actually what we use in uh, the, uh, the water boiling kettles, in electric irons, there's a conductive wire, okay? As uh, there's a current passing through that, uh, the, the wire, so there'll be uh, some certain of heat dissipation, which is equal to I squared R, okay? So uh, this is how we can uh, the quantify or provide the, the conductive heat. 
actually the other two mechanisms are really uh, the complicated the, the frictional heat is really complicated and then we can provide some equations but i'm not going to provide that uh, course uh, it is not the focus of this course uh, to provide those uh, the complicated equation on, on the other hand the frictional heat is not well understood or properly model for most of the polymer processing applications okay so it's really complicated uh, for the, the shear flow, actually, the viscous heat generation per unit volume can be given by these equations, right? So for a Newtonian fluid, so that we discussed in the first lesson, the Newtonian and non-Newtonian behaviors, right? For a Newtonian fluid, the viscous heat generation per unit volume is given by the viscosity times gamma dot to the power two, okay? The viscosity is this one, and the gamma dot means the shear rate to the power two, for a power law or a non-Newtonian fluid, uh, the viscous heat generation per unit volume can be given by this equation, which has the K times gamma dot uh, to the power N plus one. Here K is the consistency index that we discussed in the, the power law model in the lesson number one. Here the gamma dot again, it is the shear rate. Okay, hope it is clear. So uh, the, we can prove these equations, but I just mentioned them. So then therefore you don't want to know how to prove them actually. We, we already discussed these equations in our previous slides. So then here I would like to give you some kind of indication how we can get this unit uh, for these equations. Okay, so this is the power law model that we discussed uh, in, uh, in the lesson number one. Okay, here the K is the consistency index and uh, you can see that K is equal to shear stress divided by gamma dot to the power N, right? Shear stress is in uh, Newton per square meters, right? Okay, so then the units of the shear rate is S minus one. So then we have the N outside due to this N here, right? So then we could say that uh, the, the units for the K is N M minus two S to the power N. Okay, right, then we'll try to uh, start with one of these equations here. P is equal to K gamma dot N plus one power here, right? So then we can try to substitute the, the related unit and then we can try to get the final unit. Here you could see K, we already got the unit N M minus two S to the power N. And again, here we have the shear rate, which is having S minus one unit and then N plus one there. Right. Okay, so no, now I'm going to just simply uh, the apply the rules of indices and then uh, remove the bracket here. So it is going to be S minus N here and then S minus one if you remove the bracket. Okay, right. Uh, so then uh, the we can simplify here S N and S minus N will cancel out each other. So because they have the same powers, but with opposite signs, and then what is left is Nm minus 2s minus 1, right? So then I'm going to rearrange this term in a different way, in the way that I want. So I'm going to, I'm going to write Nm here. Okay, I added the M here. To cancel that out, I just raise the power of this one by 1. So it's going to be M minus 3 and then S minus 1 here. Okay, so we know that Newton meters mean it's joules. So then I just write this S minus 1 here. And then what is left here in this again is M minus three. Okay, joules per second is the watt, right? So then we have M minus three here, it is watt per cubic meters. Hope it is clear how we get this, uh, the unit uh, that is watt per cubic uh, the meters. So that is the viscous heat generation per unit volume. So this is for a Newtonian fluid and this is for a power law fluid or a non-Newtonian fluid. Hope it is clear. During the polymer processing, the maintaining of the processing conditions uh, are really important. Otherwise, there could be several issues like degradation of the material. It could be thermal degradation or chemical degradation of the material. And therefore, there could be some issues uh, with the product that you're going to manufacture from that molten material, okay? Therefore, polymeric materials should process without significantly changing their structure due to thermal and or thermal oxidative degradation. Right, as I mentioned before, the degradation means it is going to influence the properties of the product. So here I would like to highlight uh, a few different uh, degradation, uh, the modes actually, or the mechanisms. So one we call chain scission. So that is the breaking of the polymer chain at a random point in its backbone. Okay, so that could uh, cause some issues with the mechanical properties of course, right? And the other one is the depolymerization. We know that polymers are manufactured using polymerization reactions. Okay, the depolymerization means converting a polymer into a monomer. Okay, so reversing that uh, cause some issues uh, to the product uh, if you just don't maintain the proper conditions during the process. The other one is cross-linking. So that means the form in a chemical bond of one polymer chain to the other. Okay, so we have to make sure that uh, the, the cross-linking 
should happen at the proper time of the process. Okay, it shouldn't be earlier or later than required. So that means it is a problem. Okay, the cross-linking is important to, imp uh, to improve the properties, but it should happen at the proper time. So that means we have to maintain the set temperature of the, the, the dye maybe, okay, until the, the mold is completely full with the molten material, okay, the solidification cannot start when the mold is half full, okay, uh, the, uh, the until the mold is completely full, so the material should be molten, uh, then uh, the solidification should start after some time, okay, so therefore selection of these uh, the set temperatures within the barrel, within the dye, or within other units are really important, during the polymer processing applications. Apart from that, the molecular orientation is also really, really important, uh, the behavior during the polymer processing. Okay, we have to maintain proper molecular orientation to achieve the desired properties from the, uh, the polymeric products. Right? Normally, during most of the polymer processing applications, the molecular orientation takes place uh, in the direction of applied stress. So that is quite common way. Sometimes you have to be careful that the molecular orientation may be frozen into the product if the melt solidifies before the oriented molecules can relax back to their coiled conformation. So we call this is a residual orientation, right? So therefore we should make sure that it should happen at the proper time. Okay, another important thing we have to think about, can we just control this molecular orientation in the exact way that we need? So it is quite challenging and difficult actually. In some processes, we might not able to control the molecular orientation. Okay, so we can control them indirectly by just properly selecting the processing conditions, right? In processes like blown film extrusion, which is used to manufacture thin films for packaging materials. Okay, so we can control the molecular orientation by controlling uh, the wind up speed and also by controlling the uh, pressure inside the, uh, the bubble of the blown film. Right, we, we're going to discuss this process in detail uh, during this lesson actually. Okay, so but in, in some processes, the molecular orientation may not be controllable uh, in, a, in a good manner at all. Okay, so in, in most of the cases, actually, as I said before, the molecular orientation is something that we can control indirectly by controlling the processing parameters uh, and the, the other machine related parameters as well in some cases. Okay, uh, the, however, the maintaining of the proper molecular orientation will be really important to maintain the the properties like mechanical properties or sometimes the, some aesthetic properties like uh, the, the, uh, the opaqueness, okay, and also some other uh, the special features of a given product. Another important factor that we have to consider is whether we need anisotropic properties or isotropic properties, okay. So uh, depending on the molecular orientation, uh, the nature of the, uh, the product could be different as well, right. Let's see what the meaning of this anisotropic and isotropic behavior actually. Here you can see that isotropic in material science means that the properties of a material is the same in every direction in the material. For example, let's say that you have to maintain the tensile strength of a material in all the direction in the same way. Okay, so therefore it could be isotropic material if you can maintain in that way. But in some certain application like composites, we align the fibers only in one direction within the matrix material. So then the properties are only good in one direction. So that type of behavior is known as the, uh, the anisotropic behavior right? Isotropic means the properties are the same in all the direction. It could be whatever the properties that you need. Anisotropy means the properties are only good in one direction. So therefore, it, it, that product might not be good in uh, another, another type of applications because it might not have the desired properties to be used in other directions actually, right? So uh, anisotropic behavior, the properties might not be same in the all direction. Actually, most of the materials available to us are just quite anisotropic. So that is why the, the composite materials are important actually. The composite materials, we can just uh, tailor made them to have the isotropic properties or the properties that we need in different directions, right? So you might learn the composite materials uh, at some point in your degree actually, right? Okay, for now you can remember that isotropic means uh, that the properties of a material is the same in every direction in the material. Anisotropy means the properties may not be the same in all the direction Okay, the some properties might only be good at in one direction. For example, uh, in uh, unidirectional fibers in composites, the properties are only good in axial direction because the fibers are aligned only in one direction, right? There, therefore, that particular structure might not have good properties in the transverse direction or in the other direction, uh, which is not in the parallel direction to the fibers. Hope it is clear.